There we go. Now we're live. Now we're live. Now we're live. Okay. And we just, we start off very organically just waiting for people because occasionally people are late. Well, because they're all musicians, apparently. Drummers. <laughs> they would not say that they were late. What they would say is that they're playing to the back of the beat. Yeah. And sometimes the back of the beat is 15 minutes late, 20 minutes, half an hour. Yeah. Completely different day. Anyway, okay. Welcome everybody uh, to the Gear You Hear. This is season two, episode two. I am Emiko and I'm sitting here with my co-host Scott, the pedal guy. And before we introduce our extremely talented and illustrious guest who has a lot of really cool surprises in store for you all, we wanna take a moment to give you some house rules and a little bit of background of how this podcast runs. So here we go. The first thing is the Gear You Hear is technically an educational podcast. Uh, we focus a lot on music creation, music production, um, the technical aspects of it, but also uh, the human side of what it is to be a career creator in today's music industry. Therefore, what that means is there's no trolling, there's no bullying, there's no talk of politics, there's no talk of religion, uh, there's no sexual harassment or harassment of any kind. If you say something that is off color or um, ill, ill-classed, then we will call you out, read out your comment, and boot you out immediately. This is a one-strike-you're-out zone. However, that being said, if you have something nice to say or you're curious about something, please do feel free to type it in the comment section, and we will make sure that the questions get answered as best as they can. Um, and please remember, there are no stupid questions. The gear you hear is open to people on their, their journey of music creation in all levels and all stages and all genres. And so... What you know may be different from what someone else knows. So we encourage honest, valuable dialogue about that. Uh, and please don't feel um, ashamed or embarrassed if you have a beginner level question. We're all here to learn and we're all here to encourage. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Scott the Pedal Guy who's gonna introduce our guest for today. Well, hey everybody, good to see you. Uh, welcome back as always. Uh, and I am so very happy and excited to uh, introduce our guest for today, who is uh, guitarist and film composer Michael Brook. Uh, a lot of his um, oh, there's my voice. Uh, a lot of his uh, cre his credits include um, most recently uh, the Apple TV show Little America, which is uh, was quite a favorite of mine last year. So if you haven't seen it, you should definitely check it out. Uh, my first. Um, my first encounter of Michael's music, uh, cast your mind all the way back to the 90s, a darkened movie theater and a little movie called Heat um, and uh, where we heard Ultramarine for the first time and uh, pretty much blew my mind and I became a fan of uh, Michael's music uh, as the years went on. And uh, I reached out to Michael and he was kind enough to answer on, on his website and agreed to a uh, an interview today. So. Uh, thank you, Michael, for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation, and um, we'll we'll go from there. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Miko, you want to kick it off? I was, uh, was going to say, Scott, do you want to start? Um, no, I'll, I'll go first. That's fine. I'm actually really chomping at the bit. I'm chomping at the bit uh, with this one because uh, Michael, as we were talking pre the live button. Um, <clears throat> from one film composer to another, obviously I work on keyboards, you work on primarily on guitar. Um, so I wanted to talk with our audience about the differences in what that's like for you. Um, advantages, disadvantages, how you feel that uh, your performance on your instrument affects the composition and the scoring process differently than those of us that compose linearly? Well, I think um, g guitar is uh, has more modes of expression than a keyboard um, and more than MIDI generally. Um, <clears throat> in, in MIDI, and say on a piano, you can say when you hit the note and how hard you hit it. Maybe there's a couple of other little, there's pedals few other things you can do in terms of uh, dimensions of expression. And in guitar, which is not better, it's just, just different, um, you have things like how hard you hit the string, where you hit it, 
Are you slightly dampening it? Do you wiggle the note? All sorts of things uh, and many other things. You can play harmonics sure. um, and so on. So, Whammy bar. Yep. So you, you inherently have, uh, in general, a more, a performance that just has more expression in it. And so that's good, I think, in a way for efficiently getting something emotional into a piece of music. Um, and where you're at a disadvantage is maybe on what you might call the architectural side, mm -hmm. that if you're trying to make a large composition, many layers, many parts um, for other players, like an orchestra or something, um, guitar is not as good at that kind of thing. Um, all, and, and also, I think as a guitar player, I'm just not as good at thinking about that sort of thing. Mm. Um, in, in general, I lean more towards the real time aspect of I compose by improvising and then throw away the bad bits. Um, and, uh, and then I'll get some, some things and then they will inspire adding to it and so on. But I think when you, when you play a keyboard, I think just in general, keyboard players have a, I think a greater sense of, of harmonic structure because they're playing a harmonic structure. And yes, you can play chords on a guitar, but it's not as big a thing as it is on keyboard. Do you feel that MIDI guitar has um, improved or augmented advantages for you as a, as a composer guitarist? Big time. Um, I, I've been using it since it, I think the, the IVL, the first sort of standalone guitar to MIDI thing. Oh, last and, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And whatever the newest guitar to MIDI thing you have is always the best. Um, mm -hmm. and then you get another one and you can't, you can't understand how you could use that crappy one that was great before. Um, but I do, I do think there's been a big breakthrough with, um, Oh, what are they called? <laughs> uh, the triple play, uh, mm -hmm. Fishman. Yeah, yeah, um, I've, had a, I've had a look at that one. It's pretty cool. It's um, well, I've owned almost everything, and uh, you, most of the guitar to MIDI um, converters, they require you to slightly learn a new instrument. You have, mm -hmm. you really have to adjust your technique. You all sorts of either sloppy or expressive things that are just naturally part of guitar playing mess up the MIDI. And then you spend all day tidying it up. Um, the, the Fishman uh, is the first one I've played that doesn't create a lot as much garbage, but also really has your touch translates. And most mm -hmm. of the other ones I always found it was sort of, it was so nonlinear. You'd play something quiet and it'd be way too quiet. And, and I know you can adjust all that, but I never found anything that uh, in the slightest got comfortable. But the Fishman is pretty darn good now. Um, mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I've done piano parts that people really comment on the expressiveness of it. Uh, so it's good. And it's just also f as a guitar player and, and a completely incompetent keyboard player, um, I can uh, sort of just, I can go for something without having to translate it to, a, you know, a way of playing that is foreign to me. Mm -hmm. So it's really good. And they're not sponsoring me or anything, but I, I really think it's good. You have to set it up right. And I just dedicate a guitar to it, kind of. Do you, uh, which, which guitar are you using for that? Are you using like a, a, a GK3 MIDI pickup or is it going through a... Um, is it? Is it? It's 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 got its own uh, pickup. Uh, so you can yeah, just attach I'll show guitar. you. I'll show you. Right. Um, <clears throat> yes, folks. That's one thing you get to see in this is you get to actually see the studio. So yeah. this is a uh, first for us. All right. So. Aha. Uh -huh. It's a uh, J Mascus Squire, nice. which is an incredibly good guitar. Like I don't understand. I mean, it's it's one of I have about thirty guitars or forty. And it's one of my favorites and I use it all the time, even not for MIDI, um, but it's super cheap. Um, so there's the, there's the pickup. There you go. Uh, there. Um, and then there's the, 
the electronics, which is wireless, which at first I was really uh, thought was hmm. a dumb idea. Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, if if you're in a if you're in a studio as a composer where you're playing and recording all the time, you're in a chair with wheels, and um, a big uh, sort of ergonomic challenge for me was there was always bloody wires under my wheels. <laughs> you know, <laughs> phone, things like that. And so um, I, I I think I have partially solved that, but I do appreciate now the wireless thing and the battery yeah. lasts pretty long. Um, but it's it's excellent. Like um, I, I would say, um, you, especially as if you worked at it, you, you could get performances that people just would not know it was MIDI. That's excellent. That's excellent. I, I did use, um, I still have actually the, the the first Yamaha MIDI guitar from the eighties, the one that all, every string was a high E string. Oh, um, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I can't, I can't tell if that thing will still work or not, but uh, I bought it from like, I think Gino Vanelli's brother or something back in the nineties. <laughs> right. Um, back when people used the recycler to buy shot, used instruments and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, the but I last you see about ten years ago, a little over ten years ago now, when I was working for Cakewalk and I was on on the road doing sonar clinics and all that. I'm not a I'm not a keyboard player at all. I, I I'm horrible at keys, but uh, love MIDI, love guitar. So I brought a Traveler acoustic guitar on the road with a with a GK3 MIDI pickup and a brain and all that stuff. Okay. And I got to tell you, when you get to Texas and places like that, you start playing like drum drum patterns and things on a, on a low E string, it freaks people the hell out. Yeah. Um, and uh, just, I think there's still something really magical about MIDI guitar that um, it's, it's, it's shrouded in mystery to a certain degree because guitarists have always been kind of shy from technology um, until it stares them right in the face where as long as it's something that's really simple and I can use like an eye rig or whatever, <laughs> then I'm in good shape. But what I found, like you know, going back to like say the first couple of records of yours, you know, say Cobalt Blue, um, which has MIDI guitar on it. Uh, that actually was what I was going to ask because you know when I hear st uh, cuts from that album like Breakdown, um, it sounds like you'd be using a looper, but this is 1992 and loopers weren't exactly out and about at that no, point. No, I was using a looper. You were using uh, looper, okay. Yeah, uh, it was this English company. Uh, forgotten the name of it. It was, um, yeah, one of the first loopers. But the key thing was it could be MIDI controlled. Uh -huh. um, before that, um, I was using the Electro Harmonics 16 second delay, which mm -hmm. is still, I mean, a magic, magic device because uh, of the sound, but you couldn't sync it. Mm. But the, the English one, well, I, I blank it on the name. But um, yeah, I did use that, and then um, the that was with the IVL using um, like the DX7 for some of those marimba mm -hmm. or like buzzy marimba sounds, and it was, you know, you could you had to practice so much to get it right. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, I can only imagine, especially live. <laughs> yeah, there was a live album that accompanied that as well, right? From the yeah, uh, yeah, from the aquarium. Yeah, right. It was, it was some pretty cool stuff. I mean, back then it was really groundbreaking. And I think a, a person who's listening in 2021 may have some trouble understanding the amount of work that went into, you know, composing a piece like that, or like say Ultramarine or Shona Bridge or something like that. Mm -hmm. And knowing the kind of, of work that has to actually go on behind the scenes to make something like that happen. Whereas now, it's quite a bit simpler in so in some regards as far as getting the idea down fast when you've got tools like Ableton Live and all that. Yeah. So my, you know, my my hats off to you on on uh, really innovating um, at that time. So uh, and also um, to remind everybody who's watching, uh, we get to actually see Michael's pedal board and his his rig. So uh, we're gonna. I think this would be a good time to segue over to that so people can see what you what you're using these days. Okay. Um, let me try and change the camera here. All right. We can do that and we will bounce out. Let's see here. Yay, technology. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, how about that? Oh, well, that's me. There we go. Okay, so there's my strikingly handsome feet. 
And um, so, well, we, we did, Scott, we talked about focusing on a pedal. So there's the memory man. Um, that's an old one. Um, and um, that's actually where the piece Alter Marine came from. Um, when I was playing with it and realized, uh, I didn't even musically understand it, that like a dotted eighth could give you a sort of syncopation and make your rhythm, well, make it sound like you're playing a lot more than you actually are. Um, and I, I have an old one and a new one, and they're both great. Um, the old one really has this mushy, um, kind of soft sound. And um, let me just, I'll, I'm just, I know we weren't going to do much showing off, but I just, it's one thing it does, it's cool, is you put a rubber uh, uh, surround on the pedal. And it, you know, um, it's just, a, it's another form of expression by, by changing the delay time as you play. Um, then this is my, I gave up on the pedal board idea um, because I have, I don't have much space in my studio. And my colleague, Craig Connard said he, he was going vertical. So we tried this and finding the right furniture was a real nightmare. And this, this table is actually um, uh, a, my, my son's toy carpentry table where the, you know, they had like a vice on it and little wooden tools. Um, but it's, it's actually the best thing we could find. So do you want me to, can you, can you guys talk to me or am I broadcasting? Uh, I can hear you. Um, yeah. can no, hear no, I, just wanted, I just wanted to ask you a question. Do you want me to just sure. quickly go through each pedal or is that too much? I'm, I'm down for it. Okay. So, yeah, or, or if you want to go through the ones that you use most in your first go-tos. Yeah. That'd be either, cool. either or, or both. Well, that's, that's something we were talking about earlier before the broadcast that there isn't, there isn't a go-to. Um, it's ah. like every, and that's why I slightly struggled with what sort like, what's, what's a pedal we should focus on. Well, um, maybe the memory man, but that, that was a slightly arbitrary choice because sure. each one can bring some magic in the right situation. I'll, I'll just quickly race through them. Yeah, go do it. Y yell at me to stop if you want. So there's a, there's a compressor, the Keeley one, which is, is pretty good. I still haven't found one I like. This old Yamaha Graphic EQ, which is great for sort of giving weird sounds. Then uh, this old Korg OD1, which I used on Cobalt Blue. Um, just a nice little overdrive. Uh, there's one of the deluxe big muffs, which is great for aggressive stuff. This super cheap Octafuzz, which I like. Uh, this is a pretty magic pedal, the white fuzz from Telex or some name like that. And um, they really, uh, it does some beautifully weird sounds, kind of like a, a wah-wah pedal where you, you're not moving it. Um, what else have we got? Then um, the Klon, the, the new or the modern Klon, which I, I like a lot. The uh, Electro Harmonics Attack Decay, which is a super great pedal for making stuff not sound like guitar. Um, and I sync it to my sequencer um, by feeding it a, a pulse. So you can have these great syncopated, uh, synchronized guitar uh, pulse effects. And it'll do backward sounds and all that. Um, Ventress uh, Reverb, which I, I like a lot uh, for often for sort of gigantic wall of sound things, not, not trying to sound like a real room. Um, the Electro Harmonics Pitchfork, which is quite remarkable. Uh, an old Sovtech Big Muff, which I, I, I'm, I think I'm gonna take off. I just never got any magic from it. I, I don't know, I kept thinking I would. Uh, an original Sans Amp, which still 
sounds great. Uh, Behringer Vibrato, the deluxe, the new memory man, which is great because you can sync it. Um, the ventilator, it's like a Leslie simulator. It's pretty, pretty nice. And then the Strymon timeline for digital echo. And then you can't see it, but I, I'm going to see if I can move the camera. So <clears throat> hold on to your horses. Uh, <clears throat> so down there, that's the uh, sound sculpture, which switches all the pedals. Um, and it's, it's really good. It's, um, super clean. Um, it's my second one actually. Um, and you, it gives you, uh, cause for recording you, uh, I, I want a really clean, uh, signal and it, it really helps super hi-fi and then a slow reverb. Uh, and then that's all the infinite stuff. Uh, let me see. Hold on. It's overloading. Uh, and a switcher for the, the memory man, the memory men. I think that's it. Uh, oh, and over here, there's a, a fuzz face because it has to be first, uh, they say, um, <clears throat> for it to do its magic. Uh, and then, so this is, this is my studio. Uh, and I, I record everything. I even listen to everything through the computer. So there's no, and I'm not using amps much really. Well, not at all. Um, I like them, but for film work, you have to um, you have to be able to get back to stuff. I find, and so, like I have a beautiful CSA AD synthesizer that is my favorite synthesizer synthesizer in the world, um, and it's actually really expressive because it has polyphonic aftertouch, but I'll record something and it's a, it's, I like the performance. And then a month later, the director will say, I love that, but can we just make it more blah? And it's like, well, no, I can't, I can't get back to it. <laughs> and the preamps and the eyes and things like that. But I, I do actually a tip for um, some of your, <clears throat> if, if you're studio players. So I was saying how wires, under your feet. And I think I found a solution, which is, can you see? Yeah. These things are like for people who want to have their keys on a belt, on a, on a, a ring. And I attach that to the guitar cable. So it'll pull out. Like if I move, well, that's not supposed to be there, but anyway, um, but it doesn't stay under my chair. And that sounds trivial. But when you're working 14 hours a day, seven days a week, it's amazing what uh, can what helps or hinders your workflow. And for me, workflow is a super big thing. I'm going to switch back to the civilian camera. That's our cue. That was that was good that you you it was just you on the screen there because. Uh, yeah. I, I was drooling in the background a little bit there. There was, <laughs> yeah. so, much, there was so many goodies. Yeah, it's it's a good setup. And, and for for example, speaking of workflow, so all the mics I might use, they're on, they're just on like a, a spring arm. Mm -hmm. oh, that's so, brilliant. And they're all they're always plugged in, and um, because it's just, it's amazing how if you lose creative momentum, um. <clears throat> You lose the vibe, and all of a sudden you're you're trying to patch something, or uh, where does this mic plug in, and and all that kind of stuff. So I, I I've put a lot of effort into trying to make everything as ready to go as possible, and it I I think it has paid off. That's fantastic. <clears throat> That's really the right way to do it. You know, I I can definitely uh, I can definitely understand where you're coming from there. Uh, Miko, over to you. Me. <laughs> I, no, I felt like I, I was monopolizing the conversation there for a bit. Not at all. I I've just been sitting there looking at looking at Michael's studio, going, "Man, I gotta clean up my rooms." Are you kidding? This is this room is disgusting. I, I'm, yeah, I'm you, this is low, low res. 
Uh, you haven't seen our big space. You you <laughs> you would just cry if you did. Um, I actually have a couple of uh, sound design, soundscaping questions for you in terms of forming sounds. Um, yeah. <clears throat> how often have you found that you'll start with a sketch or a riff? Right, I'm using the word sketch for for mm -hmm. you, obviously. Um, and then you go. Maybe you have a work print of something I don't know that's coming up a scene or whatever. And you go and you think, okay, this is what I'm hearing. This is what I'm hearing. You go in and you do it. And it's completely wrong. And it's almost like tweak after tweak after tweak. Oh, if I change the sound, if I change the effect, maybe it'll help change the mood, maybe it'll bring it out. And then you go through everything. And then at the end, you just go back to what you had. That, that does happen. Um, uh, but I, I just wanna um, uh, address one one thing of the many things you just said many things you said there um i don't think about music it for me it's it's almost always a pretty much real time thing so you know i might have a scene where i think okay maybe discard distorted guitar would be good or mm -hmm. or something like that to that degree but mm -hmm. in terms of what the music would be for me composition is com virtually completely a, it's a discovery process. It's like I'm I'm an explorer or a geographer. I, I and I'm not like an architect. Um, so do you when you get the well? So I don't forgive me because I you know obviously everybody's process process is different. But yeah, when yeah. you when you sign on for for a film or for a show, you obviously you sit down and you meet with everybody first. But then you yeah. get your prints and you get you get your your flow. Are you saying that you compose simultaneously? So you sit down, you run the work print, and you're just going, okay, I'm hearing this, I'm feeling this, or is it the type of thing where you let it marinate and then you come back to it? Uh, more, the, more the latter. Mo mostly uh, when, I, when I hear about a project, even if mm -hmm. it's not for sure, I will start sketching, because I sketch every day, and it's right. just, just to keep my fingers working. Um, but also it's a way to develop ideas. Mm -hmm. um, I, Cause I find um, creativity is a finite resource and you run out of it. Um, mm -hmm. But your schedule may demand more than you can do in that time period. So what I'll do is I'll start sketching, not thinking about scenes or characters or anything, just with, at the back of my mind with, with that project uh, mm -hmm. in my mind. Mm -hmm. And um, then when when finally formal work starts, I'll I'll have a bunch of ideas, and uh, sometimes there are ideas that were done in that initial sketching process, mm -hmm. and some and because I I have I don't know like thirty five hundred sketches or something like that, some of which is on my website and right. some of it isn't. Um, uh, we'll go through those, and some of those will. Again, I will have been in a different state of mind when I did those sketches. Maybe they're a year or 10 years old, mm -hmm. and it, it helps to, to widen the palette in a natural way rather than saying, okay, now I got to get really uh, aggressive and electronically, electronic y and all that kind of thing. Whereas I may, may not be in that mode right now. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. But also, when you said about do you ever go completely around the circuit and come back to the same thing? Um, on, on Into the Wild, um, I, I had done a lot of sketches for that and a lot of them were, ended up being in the temp score and they were, some of them were embarrassing. You know, there, it was before, like my room now is soundproofed and sound treated, mm -hmm. but I didn't have that then. And so some of them, you could hear somebody working on my neighbor's house hammering. <laughs> <laughs> And so, uh, oh dear. The um, so I thought, okay, I'm going to tidy these up. Or I, I made like em they are embarrassing mistakes because again, I'm exploring. I'm I don't know I don't know what I'm going to do. And mm -hmm. sometimes, often, I'm I make a mistake that just sounds like crap. Um, so, so anyway, that these these roughs were in in the temp, and uh, Sean Penn was the director. And so I finished the pieces and I made them all proper. And he's like, can I hear the original ones? You know, and so I said, yeah, but they're really rough and all that. So we listened to that and he, and he said, I, I like those better. So that's what went in the film for some wow. of the 
some of the score. That's excellent. Amazing. Well, it's, you know, you can, there's a sort of sense of our obligation to our craft to, to not have blatant mistakes or like my timing's not very good. So I'll often fix that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but also there is sometimes there's this, uh, there's a, a sense of an overall uh, wholeness about a, per, a real performance yeah. that uh, sometimes is better, even with its flaws. Right. So how did the, uh, the little America project come along? Um, that was a, that was actually a surprise show for me to, to really get yeah. into. Um, the, if you haven't seen it for those of you who may or may not have a Apple TV, um, it's a, it's a kind of a, interesting bio series of sorts of, of different stories um, of little little accomplishments uh, across America of different uh, cultures and families and and uh, really I think good stories that really make you think a little bit outside the box and, and realize that people do have people really do have interesting stories uh, that that deviate from the norm so to speak uh, and overcomings and adversities and all that fun stuff. But I found that your score uh, really complemented uh, a lot of that in in different ways because each story is is completely different. There aren't like two stories that are alike, really. Um, and so I imagine when you're scoring something like that, you probably had to, from episode to episode, think about a different theme or um, a different goal in mind or a different motif. Yeah, it, it, it was... Um it was a scheduling challenge because um, they they scheduled it like a series, which it sort of is, mm -hmm. but really it's eight different movies. They're, they're not connected except for the fact that it's about, that there's a kind of meta theme of mm -hmm. people people's experience in coming to America. And the thing I love about that that show is that it's not the cliched struggle, overcome struggle, great success. It's, it's much more nuanced than that. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so, yeah, it was, in terms of the music, uh, it was uh, totally great, totally fine. Just the schedule was, was a, bit of, a bit crazy because like doing a new 30 minute movie uh, this week, and that has no connection to anything you've done before. Mm -hmm. uh, but that I, I, I came into it through uh, one of the showrunners, Sean Hedder, and I had, I had worked with her on um, a film called Tallulah that, that she directed before. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was great. I mean, I'm so, why did the COVID have to happen to me? I mean, it's like we were going to do another season, but of course it's all, based on people being able to go to locations. So right. uh, it, and it, they wanted to renew it, but um, it's gotta be a, what, a year or a year and a half before you can go anywhere, especially to some of the locations they, they went to. So who knows? But yeah, it is a gem, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mika, have you seen it by any chance? Uh, I have. I started to, and then I didn't finish. It's worth a watch for sure. It if happens. You got, a, if you got a couple hours to kill. I I will I will have my mea culpa moment and say, unfortunately, I started a lot of things and then I didn't because actually, Michael, the opposite happened to me where all the non-location stuff started coming out of the woodwork and people started going, oh, let's uncan the production that we can and let's actually get things finished. So right. it's been, oh, I'm going to binge watch this. I'm going to catch up. No, nope, wait, I have to score this. I have to do a trailer for that. I have to, I have, <laughs> and it's literally just sitting, you know. Um, but I did want to ask you actually, in terms of in terms of the COVID, uh, and because as as film scores, we do sit largely on our keisters. It's 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 a very um, it's a physical endeavor in and of itself to sit that still. I think for such a long prolonged period of time. How, how have you used your time in terms of expanding your rig or augmenting your studio or maybe integrating ideas that you've had that you didn't have time for before and now you do? Is there anything new that uh, that you've been putting in there or anything old that you've been taking out? Well, um, 
up until February 2020, the previous three years had just been, well, too, it, it, it's hard to imagine, but too busy. And, sure. um, you know, it's kind of be careful what you wish for. <laughs> right. and, like I, I was just working too much and, you know, my back was getting injured and all that sort of kind of stuff. So when um, COVID started, it happened to coincide with just the end of a bunch of projects. So I thought, great, got a time to regroup, update some things and, and so on. So actually the whole pedal setup is new. That was done in, in March of 2020. Um, and then I, I got a new computer and I don't know if that much else has changed. I mean, for a while I didn't really want to do any, I didn't want to be in the studio. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, the whole the whole pedal rig is completely new, and some of the pedals and some of them are just old favorites. Mm -hmm. Well, as a keyboard player, I can tell you that I love seeing your pedals elevated uh, because that's how most of us use them as yeah hand crank, hand crank devices, not well, stop also, devices. I mean, um, even as a guitar player, you. You know, there's a whole other thing you can do if you can get at the controls. Right. Um, so, um, like, well, with the memory man, with the foot, the rubber thing on the, the delay knob. Um, and then I can, I'm using the switcher, the switchblade. Um, I, I don't really change it that much in real time, it turns out. I thought I would, because I, I had one for a tour before, and I'd have all these presets mm -hmm. and, and things like that, and it's unbelievably good. Um, but it's turned out that, uh, it's just a, a, a very clean path. And when you turn something off, it's not in the path anymore. Um, and I'm, I'm, I actually don't have any presets. I just turn because usually for film stuff, I'm, I'll explore, get a sound, then I'll record it and I'll try and, um, document it somehow and then just move on. Mm -hmm. Right. I did want to ask you about your sound, your sound choices uh, for film scoring. I have a buddy of mine who is also a composer, Charlie Clauser. Uh, oh yeah, this, I, right? I, I know all, of him. Yeah, he's great. He has a he has a studio on the complex that his house is on, and this thing is like a warehouse of. You would think that you were going to a flea market garage sale of throwaway stuff. Yeah, and when I go, pre COVID, right when I would go visit. And he'd say, oh, I picked up this great wheelbarrow the other day. And I'd go, what's that for? And I'm assuming it's to haul gear around. No, yeah. no. If I hit it with a hammer, it sounds like this. And I can get the resonance and the frequencies, and I can sample them and put them through this, and then run them through a ring modulator, and then ta-da! Here's the scene. That's my wheelbarrow. And I just right. went, what? <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? No, but it's but it's really intense. Like he takes that so seriously. So I'm just curious to know. You were talking about being on location. Do you ever find inspiration from uh, either exotic sounds or run of the mill things that may present themselves differently when you're traveling? And do you try to incorporate that either through sound design or sampling into any of your compositions and your scores? Um. Well, I, I don't really travel anymore. It's when, when I used to tour. Right. Um, but since I've been doing pretty much nonstop film and TV work, I I don't leave this room much. <laughs> so actually COVID didn't make that much difference to my lifestyle. Right, yeah. <laughs> I'm just kind of locked up. Um, yeah, uh, some, some things like, um, uh, well, I have this guitar. I don't get it. It's a resonator guitar, but it's kind of unusual. It's a called a Pogriva. Mm -hmm. And it's this guy, Larry Pogriva, who, who doesn't make them anymore. But um, oh it's oh, just, is... it's like uh, it's Wait, I'm gonna, aluminum. I'm going to bounce this out, Scott, just so that and we it can looks get like it. It's uh, sort of a junkyard. It's got a, a hubcap for the, that, that's like a Dodge Lancer hubcap to cover the strings, the bridge. And I don't know if you can hear it, but it's kind of like a reverb on my voice. Um, and yeah. then it does these kind of. Oh, 
wrong things. And it's just like if I play a note. I, I don't know if that was captured, but just that. Oh, yeah. The yeah there. Um, so I'll, sometimes I'll just use elements like that, or I'll use it as a percussion instrument. Um, but in terms of uh, uh, sort of junkyard stuff, um, I don't have really that much of that. But I, I do like... Um, just manipulating sounds a lot, which I do mostly in the computer, sometimes with a pedal, um, where it's not clear what what the sound is. Right. right. Um, it and and I think uh, actually I just read an interview with with Charlie Klauser where he said he likes to always or as much as possible start with a kind of organic element and then treat it. And he feels that that has something um, that maybe a purely electronic source would not. Yeah. And, and I agree with that, that um, if I'm sure people who are incredibly good at electronics can make things that are as good, but most of us don't really know how to do that. And so starting with something that has some uh, acoustic properties, I think, uh, can be inspiring and then you can and also it, again as part of the exploration process of do i find something that uh creates some emo emotion in me whether it's a sound or a part um is kind of in my opinion what it's all about um i think there are i'm at one end of the spectrum and maybe maybe charlie is too that and then there's there's sort of the more I'm going to write with a paper and pencil everything and then have people play it. And play right. It. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's different horses for different courses. Sure. Well, I mean, he, he always says that in the time it takes to electronically manipulate something to synthesize whatever the sound is, you know, the end result is that I could just go out and bang the hammer on the wheelbarrow in the same amount of time that it takes to sample it and, you know, do whatever he's doing is, uh, is exactly what somebody would do if they started with the sample to get there anyway. And he said, so it's, there's a humanness, I think, in, in film scoring that is uh, required in some, in some ways, like you said, different horses for different courses, but, um, or the other way around. I, I got it backwards. It's different courses. For horses different for different horses, horses right? It's <laughs> <laughs> like, wait a minute. I'll have to remember uh, that one. <laughs> <laughs> I've, always, I've always gone to the old standby. It's different, different strokes for different blokes. Um, so I'll have to, I'll have to remember that one. Um, so uh, I, I want to circle back to something you said earlier, because I, I was kind of fascinated with the, the um, you were talking about compression for a second there and, and uh, talking about you haven't found a compressor that you like yet. Um, and uh, it seemed to me listening to a lot of your tracks, the compression plays a pretty big role uh, in the guitar, uh, yeah. especially capturing that that pluckiness uh, that you're looking for in some of the uh, in some of the clean tracks. So, um, if you can recall, what what was the trick to that? Um, and the reason I'm asking is because, uh, and this is a goal, you know, on the, the Pedal Guy channel, a lot is to talk about how to actually use the products. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. People, oh, people incorrectly use compressors every day um and it, it's just it all the dynamics are gone when it's used ineffectively but so many dynamics can be introduced when it's used the right way and, yeah um i think if if uh you know if you'd give me a little bit of give our, our viewers uh, a little bit of mindset on that of, of what your mental picture is when you're working with compression um how it works in your in your in your setup there well, I have probably two uh, two goals with compression for for guitar, and one is um, that I forgot to show you. Um, I invented this thing called the Infinite Guitar, which right. is like a sustainer thing, mm -hmm. and um, it's really quiet. So I do have to compress the signal, um, 
And um, so there, I want extreme compression. And um, what did I, I used to use a DOD one, and that was pretty good. But what I found is um, when you have a, a very, a, a lot of compression, a lot of gain, um, so far, none of the ones I've used um, don't always let that first transient through. So there's like this click that, that takes your head off. Um, and uh, I, there's maybe maybe you would know actually. Um, there there used to be a hardware device that probably still exists called the Transient Designer, made by SPL, and that uses a different mode of uh, controlling dynamics. And so there there is no attack. It, it's because it it the way the circuitry is designed. So it's kind of like a zero attack. Sure. Um, and uh, I have plugins that do that now, uh, which mm -hmm. are great. And I, I use them a lot. Um, but I don't think a pedal does that, that I'm aware of. No. Uh, I'm sure there, there, I know there are some really fancy uh, compression units out there. Um, and what I've come to find is that it it's a challenge to transmit the message and the methodology of how to use it effectively to a point where somebody's going to, you know, plunk down the money and buy it. Right. Um, and that that's half the challenge right there. Sometimes people just go for the easy button and just okay, I'll just switch the saturation up to here, and we'll just let we'll just let it rip and see what happens. Um, I I I vaguely remember that uh, that piece that SPL piece. Uh, going back to when SPL used to make plugins for Steinberg back when I was working at Steinberg, uh, yeah. North America, long before Steinberg Yamaha or Steinberg Pinnacle or all the other, all the other iterations of Steinberg. Um, and, uh, I remember the, the DSer in particular, uh, -huh. uh, was a really good feat, was a really good plugin that SPL made. And, and I think the thing about them is that they found a way to roll off the sibilates so well that it's almost uh -huh. like a look ahead. And yeah. maybe that's what maybe that's what we're referring to is more of a look ahead sort of feature to try to round off the initial attack of a compressor. Well, the 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 transient designer worked in a different way where it would take there were two envelope not to get too technical but it, there were two envelope followers mm -hmm. a slow one and a fast one and it would take the difference between those two and instantly get a control voltage. Ah. So it does, it, it, traditional compressor designs, which are great, um, inherently have to have some time for them to respond. But this is kind of instantaneous. And um, there, there were like rack mount units to do it. And now SBL make a plug-in, but I don't find it quite as good as the, the Sonox one. But I don't think there's a guitar pedal that does it. And it's it's a real problem. Like if you want that sort of, because the the other use I find for a compressor is where you're paint you're playing pretty softly and you you want to hear all of the sustain and the and the the decay of the note and mm -hmm. so like a Chris Isaac type type mm -hmm. sound very clean sure. um, but with, where uh, <clears throat> you hear the notes for a long time and um, the the standard pedals are pretty decent for that I I find and the, the Keeley one. I think it's a pretty good one, but I've tried about eight of them. Yeah, Bob makes some really great, great, really great pedals. I, I'm a big fan of the Keeley, yeah. the Keeley brand in particular. Um, the Dark Side was the one that that grabbed me the first time I tried that pedal out because, oh, it's another pedal. It's going to emulate the Pink Floyd sound. Or is it really going to be there? And well, yeah, he nailed it because <laughs> it does <laughs> yeah, sound it. it does sound pretty damn good actually, uh, especially when you put it through the right uh, the right guitars. We, uh, Miko, you got something for us. We have like, a, we actually have, have a, a question. An, an audience question. We have an audience question. Yeah, nice. well, actually we've got it. We've got, I've been monitoring. So, so just Michael, if you see me going off over here, I'm not being rude or checking out. I'm answering people that are wanting to talk to you, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, so we have, uh, uh, Casey who has joined us on our Facebook page, who apparently loves your set, your, your setup. Um, uh, oh, this is very nice. We have a Dean who says the SPL transient designer is awesome. It's a great piece. Uh, Dean works with the uh, prog band. Yes. So 
there you go, live music to the studio. Um, Celine has a question. Uh, where did it go? There it is. She said, uh, which soundtrack took the longest to make? I'm going to add to that and say, and why? <laughs> <laughs> and, and let's let's cut out the whole, oh, the director was being difficult or we had you know technical production issues with the studio, yada, yada, yada. But in terms of, from a composition standpoint, which, which soundtrack do you feel took the longest and was the most laborious for you? Um. I don't, I don't really remember, um, but uh, I know two that took a long time. One was um, called Juveniles, mm -hmm. and a really, really cool film. Um, and uh, it was a, um, a first time director who, who was great. Um, and I think he just didn't know how the process worked or cause he mm -hmm. hadn't done it before. Right. And so for him, it was sort of, well, let's just keep having fun. And, <laughs> and, and it is fun, but um, it's also my job and I, I have other things, you know, to do. Um, <clears throat> but that all worked out great. Uh, and then the other one was uh, a film last year uh, called Tiger Tail um, for Netflix where, um, the the struggle with that was to make it simple enough, and the director mm. had an amazing vi uh, vision, um, and uh, and he he was an incredibly good piano player, so he he's a musician, and it took so long, like just okay, these three notes, so we can try this and that, and it did make a difference, right. um, and then that the, the the actual fundamental nature of the film changed they reshot some stuff and things like that right. um so that that covered a long time span on the calendar and it took up a fair bit of of real time but partly there were gaps right um and then sort of the challenges of finding you know something it was unusual that the challenge was to find the minimal thing that would do what was required Right. Yeah. Have you ever found that, I mean, I know different directors do things in different orders and there are some that will give everything up, like you're involved from the beginning. And then there are others that will go, oh, I guess actually we should have this through composed score, so on and so forth. Have you ever had situations where um, you compose one version and you think, great, I'm good. I'm done. It's all signed off on. And then special effects come back and go, actually, and then you find yourself having to sort of recompose around things that have been added in later after the fact. Um, not so much that. And um, I have many times I've, I've tried when it, when a film is going to have um sound effects that are going to make a, an above average contribution. Right. Um, I really try to get a dialogue going with the sound designer and, and, and also uh, kind of liaise with the editor or the director to say, why don't we, we don't have to commit, but let's make a plan. Uh, what, what's going to be front and center here? Is it going to be effects or score and that mm -hmm. kind of thing? And um, actually on, on one IMAX film I did, I got to work with the sound designer a bit and it's just so much better. But um, <clears throat> the reality is that on the, the, most of the time, the, the sound design is happening concurrently with the score. It's all last minute. And yeah. so they don't, the sound designers, they don't have time to, bring a composer into the loop. Yeah. And so um, what what happens is uh, on a few things I've worked on, it's where the sound design has covered everything. Mm -hmm. And so then it's like, okay, we, where what sound design are we going to throw out to make room for score? Um, and, and that's maybe that's not a bad way to do it in that it, you're safe, everything's covered. 
Yeah. I think maybe maybe some directors find that approach a little um they would rather start with nothing and add things that yeah uh, right to see what works rather than con because it's a little counterintuitive and maybe just different for different people right. um or horses um it's a it's a different way to do it and they might want to start when everything is there and it sounds complete right. they're not sure about well what what's the part that should go or maybe there shouldn't be music which well so that was going to be my follow-up question is do you do you ever find especially when working with sound designers and effects that like you might have like in pre-production meetings we talk a lot about oh there's going to be machine gun or an explosion or whatever so you know the music should be x and the emotion is this or this is what's happening and so we need quick cuts and we need music to go with that or whatever but then later you sit down with sound design and they pose the question well so there's a few different types of explosions that we can make happen, but what's the music going to be like? And you, and then you say, well, what type of music would you like for the explosion that you have designed? Right. Yeah. Because there's also frequency issues that one has to sit either beneath or beside another. So how do you find yourself working out those mini challenges, which can actually be quite, you know, large in, in the grand scheme of how the film is presented in terms of the emotional impact it has on the audience. Well, um, you know, um, composers like all, all people in, in media to a certain degree get typecast and, and tend to work within a certain territory or genre or, or whatever. And, um, I'm actually trying to think if I've ever worked on a film that had an explosion in it. Oh, <laughs> fair, fair enough. Well, yeah. Fair so, enough. Uh, take okay. for example, maybe the fighter, right? Because the fighter had boxing scenes and that's yeah. true, right. So not not just necessarily fire explosions, but anything combative. Yeah. Well, then it's um, yeah, and then it was um, or a film I did just one of the last things I did in 2020 um, called embattled and uh, th that had fights in it too. And there, there was actually now that, now that I think about it, Emiko, there's something that, um, that reminded me um, there was a scene where the, I think there were maybe five different fights in it. Mm -hmm. And um, they said, okay, well, this fight's going to be, we want score to be really big here. This one, it's going to be more effects and all that kind of thing. And there was a last minute thing from at the dub stage. Uh, we've decided we want to, to not have the effects in this fight, which I hadn't done any score for. Can you do something at, at the last <laughs> minute? Okay. Um, so that kind of thing happens. But um, in general, there's less... Uh, planning and uh, discussion about that than I uh, ho would have hoped for it just in general. And it's every, because everybody's overloaded, you know, right. that's true. That's true. And, and with that, we are, we are almost at 60 minutes. So Scott, wow. do you have a la this one went by really quickly. This was yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you have a final question or two? Or Actually, no. I'm 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 pretty happy with everything here. This has been uh, this has been a great interview because uh, not only have we gotten to you know get into your into your brain there a little bit, uh, but also see what's uh, what's behind you there in the studio and getting a little tour. And that's yeah. that's a first for this channel and for the series. So thank you for uh, extending your uh, that that courtesy to us. I appreciate it very much. Sure. Yes, I, I have a question uh, for Scott. Sure. Um, why are there so many fuzz boxes? I, I, I don't get it. How? Like, what, there, there's got to be a thousand or more, right? Well, you know, you may not see. Uh, well, and actually, I can't see because we're off camera here. But there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, a bloody stump in the wall right here. But me banging my head against it all the time, going, "Why is there another distortion <laughs> panel?" Because we don't need a. I needed one like I need a hole in the head. Um, I don't get it. I, I, you know, I don't either, and. Um, <laughs> Look, I just think that uh, sometimes it can be a marketing tool. Sometimes it can be a 
sometimes it can be uh, an actual innovation, mm -hmm. um, but there are so many fuzzes. Um, like I'll take one for example, just very briefly here, like um, uh, Deep Trip Pedals out of Brazil. Uh, one of my favorite brands, and uh, whenever I bring their stuff in, it's it's pretty much already gone. Um, but he, but Do has made uh, an amazing attempt to actually model out well-known fuzzes over the years. So like tone benders and and fuzz faces, and he has one called the Bog, which is stands for Band of Gypsies, which is fashioned after Hendrix. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that that pedal probably comes closer. Than the Dunlop, than the Dunlop uh, fuzz, because I saw the the fuzz there in the background there when we were doing the tour. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's uh, it's utterly amazing. Um, but the thing is, is I think I think to your point earlier about that vibe. When you find a vibe, that's that's you've got to keep going down that road um, as fast as possible. And I think that sometimes that's what happens with with the overdrives and distortions, because no no overdrives and distortions are are quite the same really at times. But there are so many of them. Um, to my right here, I have the Headrush uh, pedal board because um, I'm in the process of shooting a whole bunch of new content for it now mm -hmm. uh, because hint, 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 there's a new firmware coming, but you didn't hear that here. Um, the, uh, there, there are some new effects, and uh, I, I can't name what they are exactly, but there are some new overdrives that are like version twos of some of the overdrives that were already there. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of... Um, Fascinating because I'm listening to it going, oh, it couldn't be that different. Why, you know, why go to all the trouble of having two modules, a version one and a version two in the same unit? Why not just have one unit? Yeah. Um, and yeah. lo and behold, they sound remarkably different. Uh, and from good? I mean, usably different. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. They, they're just okay. very, very usable. Um, I think, but I find sometimes that it's, it's the fun uh, of working with overdrives in particular that you could put them before and after delays to achieve different textures. Um, it's all about finding that, that, that magic combination. And so, well, yes, I agree. There are far too many, far too many overdrives out there. Um, and, and, and distortions and fuzzes, um, pe people just are always looking for more. And See, I, that's, yes. it's absolutely been reflected in 2020 as far as, as my business has gone because uh, I've honestly never been so busy in my life. Uh, I'm, I'm at the post office and FedEx every day shipping off product because people are home and they need to have a creative outlet. And thankfully they're all doing it through music. So mm -hmm. uh, happy to support that in any way that I can. And um, I've moved a, I've moved a distortion pedal or two since, <laughs> since the beginning of the pandemic for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting that you're asking about that, Michael, because as a keyboard player, any chance, I don't notice that there are so many actually because there are a bunch that I use and they they all serve different purposes mm -hmm. and I don't know if that's perhaps because it affects my original tone differently each time so for me it's always about being not a guitar I'm so not a guitar player to the point that I have a keytar that's how cool. non guitar player I am but again those pedals, each and every one makes a complete different difference to this rig. So it's interesting to hear a guitar player say, why are there so many where I'm going, I need more. Well, no, no, no. I mean, I, I get that lots of pedals are, are different and each, each one brings something different to the table, but it, it's more, can there be any gaps left and any <laughs> niches? Because there are so many, and I'm, I, I don't even know how you, where you start. Like, how do you, there, there must be X number of clones of, of all the famous yeah, fuzzes. Well, right. yeah. and, sure. and so, okay. So there's 20 tone benders and, right. uh, or whatever. Um, and, and it's, it's hard. Well, same with, uh, it's hard to imagine that that's a viable business. Same with when you go to NAM, you see, how many Strat copies can there be? I mean, and yeah. I, I'm not complaining. I'm just, I'm puzzled that that would be a viable business to do that. But it, it must oh. be because they keep doing it. That it is, it is. But it's always about the marketing. It's always about the message. Um, yeah. I'll give you a great example. Um, and it's not a distortion pedal, but it's 
This is a, an audio IO that I, I recently uh, picked up last year and uh, here, I'll hold up to the camera here a little bit closer. This is oh, yeah. the uh, Axe IO from uh, IK Multimedia. Yeah. And so this is this was IK Multimedia's like first attempt to really go legit with their audio interfaces um, because they're known obviously for being the iRig company uh, and coming up with that. And I remember when, when, when they showed that to me years and years ago, back when I was working at that other, working as a buyer for that other chain store out there. And, um, they showed me the new, uh, the new product and, uh, I thought, Hey, that's great. And I never thought that the iRig would blow up like it did. But the thing here is that, um, what makes this special for guitar players is this, is this Z-tone function, which is right here at the top. This is a, a JFET, um, transformer for specifically made for really honing in the guitar sound. Um, and it's the thing that actually stood apart for me in, in listening to it because all of a sudden I could actually get an actual really great guitar sound just from plugging in, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite a challenge um, because most audio interfaces will roll off different frequencies, can't handle every frequency range and don't really give you any sort of customization. And it was the thing that drove it, uh, that really made that product stand apart from the rest of the bazillion audio interfaces that are out there. Uh -huh. um, having been responsible for unleashing some of those nightmares on people. Um, <laughs> it, was in, it was refreshing to find uh, something that has been, uh, something that's been quite a unique uh, proposition, but that's one of those things like, it's a minor innovation to some, but to those select people, it's a major innovation. And, and sometimes that happens with uh, with overdrives and, and, and all of that in particular, like uh, you were mentioning Klon earlier. Um, Klon was a really big deal. The Klon emulations have been a really big deal for the last couple of years because it was a very distinct sound, a very unique sound. And if you were able to actually find a Klon on the market, you were shelling out, you're shelling out 2,500 bucks to $3,000 easily for the real deal. Uh, and then this company called NuX came out with one that has the silver and the gold edition. Um, it sounds convincingly very close and it's 69 bucks. So it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's sign of the times. Um, there, there is so much retro history besides big muffs and uh, some of the other standbys that have not been explored enough. And I think a lot of those are coming to light now um, in, in other, in other uh, categories as well, like delay pedals. Uh, there's a really big, Re-emphasis on dual delays now, and really emulating tape echoes to a point where it sounds convincingly close to the original deal. So, it, it the the train is going to keep going. It's already left the station, and it just keeps going throughout uh, popular culture. And if it finds its way on a Billie Eilish record, everybody's going to want it. So, uh, I'm just trying to think of somebody popular. Sorry, um, that uh, you know would would, uh, would spur the moment where people are going to you know, hear it and then want to have it like auto tune, for example, that, 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 that went away out of fashion after the second time around. And I'm sure it's at this point now it's probably due for another resurgence of somebody to do something wanky with the auto tune. And then all of a sudden people are going to, uh, going to want that effect again. So it, it's all cyclical. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I, I guess I, I want a, um, a curator, um, to, uh, condense this tsunami of information of of these different i mean fuzzes are just an example but it's maybe that's what you do i don't know <laughs> to a certain it's, degree yeah to a certain degree um i think the second you when you start doing videos and how to do this or how to do that one thing i've learned over the last four plus years is just uh, the web is out there and everybody's got an opinion and uh, sometimes they will share it with you happily. Sometimes they will share it with you not so happily um, right. and uh, be rather critical and nasty, but that's just the, the way it is. I did a video last week where I did how to show, I showed people how to sound like Metallica and I was sweating bullets all the way to the end on that one, just because the second you go into that genre and you start talking to that, that community, they are so aggressive and, if God forbid you should get one of the sounds wrong or one of the notes wrong, 
they'll they'll tear you a new one. And uh, thankfully, nobody's nobody's done that yet. It's been it's been rather well received. So maybe maybe it was using my maybe it was using my my awesome explorer here uh, oh. that legitimized my my playing on that. <laughs> Even though I can't play I can't play those riffs like I used to. So it's always uh, it's always a challenge. But yeah, that's. The, the curation, I think itself would be actually quite an interesting career choice for someone uh, because it, it, it is like, there are like pieces of art when you think about it sometimes yeah. um, and, and what they've, what they've done for popular music. Right. That's, that's true. And speaking of, speaking of negative feedback and positive feedback on the web, we will end with the fact that there's a lot of great compliments, Michael, to you. We have somebody who's saying that uh, Affliction is one of their favorite soundtracks. Um, somebody else said they love the, they love the, uh, where did it go? The album with, I don't want to bash, uh, butcher his name. Pete, is it Peter Newton? Is that how you say yeah, it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's, that's a great record. And I really recommend people that's uh, called sleep sleeps with the fishes or sleep mm -hmm. with. The fishes. Um, yeah, that was a magic moment. That's really, well, he 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 took time to write in about that. Somebody else wrote, "MB is a master mood player." So there you you're, go. You're getting you're getting a lot of love today, Michael. and and uh, and and that's awesome. And with that, we thank you so very much for for being here. Uh, oh, and your Claude has just shown up and said, "Thanks for being there, and thank you for such a great interview." And he echoed our sentiments perfectly. Oh, so, well, uh, total pleasure and great to talk to you both. Ditto. Thanks so much. Michael Burke, thank you so much. Everybody, we're going to post Michael's links so you can go check out more of his music. Check out his sketches page on his website because it's very cool. I yeah, really you enjoy can, it. You can download them too. Yeah, that, that was, uh, to me, that was the most surprising part. But uh, anyway, thank you everybody for joining us. Stay tuned. Um, we are bi-weekly, so not next week, but the week after we will be back and we will be announcing our guest next week, actually. But stay tuned because we've got a very cool lineup for season two including Michael Brook. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for joining us today on The Gear You Hear. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Take care. Excellent. See you, everybody.